Grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. On this Pentecost Sunday, we reflect on the text that was read from Acts chapter 2. Back in the 1990s, I don't know if these are still uh, popular or not, but uh, I remember seeing oxygen bars popping up in different public locations. They were sort of trendy for a while. I don't know if you noticed this or know what I'm referring to. These were places that you could go to breathe oxygen, pure oxygen. I know I saw one at um, O'Hare. I don't know if it's still there. But the idea is that you would pay per minute and then you would wear the little tube and uh, breathe in either pure oxygen or scented oxygen from a tank. I don't think it was medical grade, but that's the idea that uh, you kind of get from that. Oxygen bars showed up in such venues as nightclubs and nail salons, spas, health clubs, resorts, tanning salons, restaurants, coffee houses, taverns, airports, ski lodges, yoga studios, chiropractors, and casinos. They were everywhere. Now I know that uh, from my little bit of reading up on this, there are no controlled scientific studies to prove that these are really of much benefit, but the proponents claimed that doing this, going and, and uh, breathing the oxygen for a few minutes every day like that, would uh, strengthen your immune system, it would increase alertness and concentration, reduce stress overall, and increase your energy and alertness. It was even touted as a remedy for hangovers and headaches and sinus problems and other things. And I don't know if it works or not, I'm not a medical person, but who wouldn't want to find something uh, easy that could strengthen your immune system or improve your concentration or reduce stress and uh, give you more energy? People will do almost anything for those benefits. Breathe. Just breathe. Did you know that in the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New, the words for spirits happen to be the same word for breath. The spirit is the life of a person. How do you tell if someone is alive? Well, physically, one way is to check to see if they're breathing. God is the source of all life and breath, and human life is special in all of creation. The Genesis account says that uh, when God fashioned Adam from the clay, he then breathed into his nostrils the very breath and spirit of life. Now there are different kinds of life, different kinds of death. First there is physical life or biological life or the life of the body. And we pay so much attention to this life, the physical uh, life of our bodies. We spend billions of dollars every year on health care and fitness and diets and we do all sorts of things to try to experience biological life for as long a period as we can with as much functionality and enjoyment as possible. And there's really, I guess, nothing inherently wrong with that. God gave us our lives and our bodies and we honor God when we take good care of them. But what is tragic is when people devote all of their time and all of their focus and all of their resources to enjoying and enhancing the quality of this life, of their biological lives, while perhaps paying little or no attention at all to the life of the Spirit or the things of God or eternal life. It is fully possible to be alive physically, but to be dead on the inside. It is possible to have a healthy body, but to have an ailing, dying spirit. Every Sunday in the church, we speak the Nicene Creed and we say this, this line, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. The Holy Spirit is the one who animates the Christian church who makes us alive, not just in our bodies, but at a different level as well. Now there's some confusion in Christianity, I feel, today about the work of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes people read about the miracles and the wonderments in the Bible and 
they assume that whenever the Holy Spirit is present, that evidence of that presence is always signs and wonders. But that would be an error. That would be a mistake. The important thing to know about the Holy Spirit is that His purpose is not primarily to draw attention to Himself, but He points us to Christ. When I was younger, my family would go camping every summer. And when you go camping, there are certain things you have to take with you. You have to have a sleeping bag and um, something to cook with, a sleeping bag and a tent maybe. But you have to have a flashlight. That's one of the important tools to take with you. Now the funny thing about a flashlight is that no matter how brightly the light can shine, no matter how many uh, watts or volts or uh, how do you measure light? What is the word I'm looking for that you have? It is useless unless you point it at the right thing. A flashlight is not very helpful if you hold it just simply in front of your face and stare into the beam. In fact, to use a flashlight like that, to just stare in the light, will not help you see. It will actually perhaps even make you blind, <laughs> not able to see at all. A flashlight functions best when you use it to draw your gaze, not on it, but on the object. Whatever it is that you need to look at. Okay, that's kind of an illustration of what the Holy Spirit's work is. We do not gaze directly at the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit causes light to shine on Jesus Christ. He causes us to see and recognize the work of Jesus Christ. To testify to Him. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 15. But the role of the Holy Spirit is to give life and to invigorate the Christian church. The Spirit of Christ animates the body of Christ. All Christians are filled with the Holy Spirit. There is no such thing as a Christian who does not possess the Holy Spirit. Having the Holy Spirit within you is simply part of the definition of what it means to be a Christian. And a life filled with the Holy Spirit will be transformed to take on what the Bible calls the fruits of the Spirit. You'll begin to bear fruits of the Spirit. Namely, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And there are a lot of books and seminars and there are a lot of uh, preachers and, and experts who claim that they can revitalize your spiritual life or who claim that they can reinvigorate the church if you just use their techniques or use their strategies or their programs. And most congregations probably could use a breath of fresh air, but we have to be cautious. A lot of claims are made, a lot of benefits are promised if we just follow a certain program, if we use a certain technique or a style of music or engage a certain staff person. And some of it is good and some of it is a waste of time. So think of it this way. I like to, I want to compare our spiritual health, our spiritual vitality with your physical vitality. I think many people today, in particular today, are kind of experiencing an energy crisis. Not like uh, we did in the 70s with uh, oil, but personally. You know, chronic fatigue syndrome is a, an example of a recognized medical condition. And you can go to health food stores and various places and you can buy products that are supposed to charge up your energy level. They even call them energy pills or energy drinks or energy bars. When I was in college, we used to drink Mountain Dew and, and uh, that was going to keep us alert and awake throughout the night so we could study. And nowadays, you know, maybe the worst thing you can do is to down can after can of Red Bull. Do you find yourself uh, sort of dragging through the day and drinking more coffee and soda for the temporary jolt that it gives you or taking a sugary snack in the late afternoon. Well, if those things are true of the body, they can be true of the spirit. We can become sluggish. We can become lackadaisical. It almost seems at times like the church is suffering with its own case of chronic fatigue syndrome. The, the church is losing its concentration or can't seem to focus. But we need to be aware that there are counterfeit solutions to what is a real problem. Certain things might appear to bring a boost or a little bit of liveliness to a church, but maybe in the long run are unhealthy. 
The reason people buy all those energy products at the health food store or GNC is because they, they do appear to offer some temporary benefit. But when you look a little deeper, you find that the boost you get is only temporary. It's spurred by high levels of caffeine or sugar or herbal supplements. You might feel better and clearer for a few moments, but it doesn't last and then you crash and you feel even worse than you did before. And in the long run, those counterfeit sources of energy and focus, they're not good for your nerves and they're not good for your waistline. There are much better, healthier ways to stay alert and shop, sharpen your mind that don't come in a bottle or a can. In the same way, there are all sorts of counterfeit spiritualities people turn to, crystals or Eastern meditation or fortune tellers, hoping to get a little extra focus, a little extra juice to charge them through their spiritual lives. And other people rely on emotionalism or sensationalism or the manipulative techniques of the tent revivalists. God does send his spirit to animate the church. But not through emotionalism or manipulative techniques, but through the gospel, the message of God's love in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not against emotion. I'm not against uh, emotionalism per se, but we shouldn't put the cart before the horse. God's spirit will pour out on his people, he says, and we will experience new birth and renewal, but not of our own doing. It comes through the word of God. It comes through the proclamation of the gospel, our, our, our daily, regular diet of those, of those good things. I recommend to you that you read a daily devotional, or that you read a portion of scripture every day, that you pray a psalm in the morning or the Lord's Prayer at night when you go to bed. I recommend to you that you find little passages, and I can assist you if you need me to, but find passages that speak to you, that encourage you, that feed you, nourish your spirit, that you find those verses and write them down on index cards and put them on your dresser and put them at your, at your sink so while you're washing dishes at night you can memorize those passages so they can come to you and they can support you and sustain you. And that is a way to bring vitality to this congregation. It's exciting when we see people reading the Word of God and putting it into practice. Jesus Christ paid for our sins on the cross and we are his body and we are his hands and his feet and his mouthpiece to continue his ministry of healing and reconciliation in the world and how do we address the church's occasional fatigue syndrome not with spiritual junk food or high carbs and low nutrients but the pure food of God's word and the blessed sacraments in Jesus name amen and now may the peace of God which passes understanding keep your hearts and minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Please rise to confess together the words of the Nicene Creed.